You're listening to the Speaking Tongues podcast. I'm your host, El Sharice. Each week, I sit down to a conversation with multilinguals where we discuss and celebrate language, life, and culture through our own perspectives. Episode 130, Speaking Dominican Spanish. Hello, language lovers. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Speaking Tongues, the podcast in conversation with multilinguals. This week, we're staying a lot closer to home and talking about Dominican Spanish and Dominican culture in NYC with Annie of La Lorenzona. In this conversation, Annie talks to us about growing up and navigating language between bilingual school and English only school. We talk about the way Dominicans in New York City speak Spanish with a rhythm that complements the flow and the pace of the city. Annie talks to us about encountering biases that people have sadly had against Dominican Spanish and how those connotations spurred her to action with creating her IG platform and in intentionally finding Spanish classes that supported and held space for her heritage. We're also chopping it up about books and Annie shares a few of her recent Dominican reads as well as some of the reasons why it's been so important to her to showcase books that showcase Latin culture for her son. Big thank you to Annie for having this conversation with me and for sharing your language, culture, and our city with all of us. If you enjoy episodes of Speaking Tongues, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the Speaking Tongues podcast on Apple Podcasts and like and subscribe on YouTube so that other language lovers like ourselves can find the show. If you've been a longtime listener of the show or even a recent listener, you can now pledge ongoing support for the show on buymeacoffee.com or on patreon.com. Special shout out to Speaking Tongues recent supporters and patrons, Heidi L, Linnea H, Pat N, and Jotty A. For just $5 a month, you will have access to excerpts from this conversation that did not make it to the full published episode. And as you know, I wrote a book. My Food Zine of International Language and Cuisine Taste Buds Volume 1 is available now for purchase. Check social media for the sneak peek inside the book and make sure you purchase one for yourself and one for your friends. Links to all platforms are in the show notes. Okay, let's chat. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Tongues. I'm here today with Annie. How are you today, Annie? I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. I'm so happy that we had this opportunity to connect and I'm so excited to learn from you in this conversation. And uh, it's not often that I welcome not only a fellow New Yorker, but a fellow Bronxite to this show. So I'm pumped. I'm so excited. This is going to feel like a little slice of home, at least for me. I like to start each episode with the same question, which is, what is your first language and which languages have you learned to speak? Um, My first language is, is Spanish. Um, and I learned to um, speak English in school. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> what was that Probably. like? <laughs> yeah, like, what was that? I mean, it's not uncommon at all. Uh, what was that like, I guess, going to school uh, as a Spanish speaker in an English, you know, speaking environment? Well, for me, it wasn't that difficult because my parents enrolled me in a bilingual school. So I was in a bilingual school, public school from kindergarten to third grade. So our class, our, you know, our assignments, our lessons, everything was done in, in Spanish and English. I don't remember the model that they used. Um, they have like different models, like roller coaster model, like that it's like half day English, half day Spanish, or, you know, one day English, one day Spanish. I don't remember what exactly it was. Um, so I, I didn't realize that I was learning another language until literally when I went into college and Mm. I was studying to become a teacher was when I realized I was like oh I was uh uh you know I was like an ESL kid 
Um, and I didn't realize it at all. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, because when I, well, first my, my experience in a bilingual school, everybody in the school spoke Spanish and spoke English. And then when I went to Catholic school, I was only with monolingual you know, speakers, only English speakers. And I, at that point, I already spoke English, but I do remember struggling a lot. And I didn't know why until I became, until I went into college and I was in teacher like prep um, school. And then they were teaching us about what they call English language learners. And then I became, I did my master's in, in teaching English to speakers of other languages. And then that's when I was like, oh, this was me. I was that kid. <laughs> that's why I was struggling so much in, when I went to a school that, that didn't have Spanish anymore. That's so interesting how that reflection comes later, because I would imagine you being around bilingual people all those years, it was normal. So there wasn't really any need to think that anything was different until you were faced with the totally different, different language that you had to use every day. Um, when you were, I guess, in your home, you spoke Spanish at home. Um, and then maybe outside of school or with other, did you have interactions with um, people who predominantly spoke English in your community or was Spanish the language that was spoken in your community? So for us, yeah, at home, we just spoke Spanish. There was no other choice. I mean, my my dad uh, is bilingual. He speaks English and Spanish. But at home, uh, we only spoke Spanish. My mom to this day uh, speaks some words in English, but she's predominantly, you know, she's dominant in, in Spanish. So even now, I still speak to her in Spanish. Um, in the community, it was interesting because... It's kind of like what you said, it was normal for me because all of my friends were bilingual. I didn't have any friends that weren't bilingual. So everybody, we were all like in the same kind of bucket. Like we spoke Spanish at home, but amongst each other, we only spoke English. So mm -hmm. if I were to if I were to speak Spanish to my friends at from school, I would feel weird and they would feel weird. But at home, it was just, you we just spoke Spanish. I don't know. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, wait a minute. I never spoke. We never spoke to each other in Spanish ever outside of like the home. That's so interesting. Yeah, never. Even with my brother, I never speak Spanish to my brother. And we grew up together speaking Spanish to our parents and to each other. We only speak English. Yeah. That's so interesting how like, I would imagine your brain compartmentalizes the languages based on who you speak it with. So, I, I mean, I don't know, but I'm, I kind of feel like if you're used to having it at home, like your brain says, this is like the language of home. And then when you're out, like somehow your brain knows that like you have to communicate differently, even though like I'm saying this because like as a non-Spanish speaker, as a non-Latina I remember having friends who spoke Spanish at home. And then, you know, when you're kids, you want to say like, oh, how do you say this? How do you say that? And like my friends could like not put together a sentence because they thought that it was weird. Like it's weird to be speaking to you in Spanish. Like it's not, it doesn't, it didn't feel natural to them. And yeah. like, even I'm reflecting on that now as you're mentioning it. And I'm like, oh, I mean, that makes sense. But as a kid, we were like, come on, like, say something. And they just <laughs> like, <laughs> but I, I, you know, and then we'd see them with their parents and they like their parents would be speaking to them in Spanish and they would respond. And oh, my gosh, that's so cool. I actually see it now in real time with my son, because at home, we only speak Spanish. Um, and then now he's in school and he only speaks English in school. Um, but then there is a, a Spanish speaking teacher there and he speaks Spanish to her. So like the other day um, we went into like um, 
just to like visit the school. And he said something, the teacher said, did you, I think she said like, do you want something? And then I said it to him in Spanish. He said, see, sí. and then she repeated to repeated it um, in English. And he said, yes. So it was very interesting. And she was just kind of like, well, like, you know, I, like, it's funny because I know how like the brain kind of, not the how the brain works. I, like I'm not a neuroscientist, but I've taught, um, I've taught kids uh, language, English, you know, and I've worked with so many kids from that have spoken, you know, so many languages. And it, it's, it's just interesting how you're able to just kind of like switch, like in a matter of a second. And, and my son is only three years old. So it, it's really amazing to see. I think so. Definitely. Um, so we are specifically talking about Spanish as spoken in Dominican culture, which is like, I've been waiting to have a conversation about Dominican Spanish because <laughs> <laughs> I've said on other episodes that I am endlessly fascinated by the Spanish language because it's so diverse. It's so vast. And there's just so much to, to, for me, as a non-Spanish speaker, there's so much to uncover. There's so much to learn. There's so much to, you know, to see and to hear. Um, and I've said before, I'm on the record as saying that it's a little intimidating for me because I, you know, as someone who, you know, doesn't speak, I'm like, well, you know, from this place or this place and this word. And like, I'm just so conscious to like not offend anybody and saying like, you know, here it means socks and over there it means something, you know, vulgar. So, um, but I say that with love. I don't, I don't say that like, you know, um, I, I, I love Spanish. I think it's such a beautiful language and, you know, everything, but we are speaking specifically about Dominican Spanish, uh, today. So I would love to know, you know, from, from what you've observed and from what you've, um, how you've interacted with with Spanish speakers in the Bronx and in New York City. Um, how do you notice Spanish being used in the uh, Dominican community here, um, maybe compared to how it's used by other Spanish speaking communities in, in our area? Um, in terms of how we use it, I feel like everybody kind of uses it the same. Like we live in a place like that's New York City. So everybody, uh, kind of like mixes and mingles. And at the end of the day, you know, we all use the language just to get our, our point across. So in that sense, like we're all, you know, Spanish speakers, you know, we all have one purpose to just get our, our point across. Um, in terms of like, you know, that that's how I, I feel. Like I feel like when I worked in, I worked in early Head Start for a long time. And that was the first time that I had worked in a neighborhood that wasn't like predominantly Dominican. So I was working with a lot of um, people from Mexico, a lot of Mexican um, immigrants. And it was definitely, I felt exactly what you mentioned, the intimidation. I'm like, oh my God, like, are we understanding each other? Like, I remember there was a time that uh, we had to call a lot of them on the phone to like confirm appointments and whatever. And I'm like, okay, hablo contigo ahorita. So for me, ahorita means like later, right? Dominican, it means later. So she's like on the phone and I'm like, hablo con usted ahorita. And then I'm like, did she not hear me? And then like, she's still on the phone. And I'm like, I don't want to hang up on her, you know? And then I had to like go back in my brain and think about like when I've watched Mexican soap operas and ahorita for them means now. Mm. So in her mind, she's she's like waiting for me to speak and I'm waiting for her to hang up. And that's when I was like, oh, I'll just talk to you luego, luego, you know, later. And then that's when she's like, Okay, so then when we spoke about it, I'm like, no, ahorita for me means like now. And she's like, oh, no, but ahorita for me means like, I mean, ahorita for me means later. And she's like, oh, no, ahorita for me means like right now. So, but sometimes you just kind of have to like, just jump in because 
um, just jump in and kind of laugh about it because, you know, she wouldn't know the nuances in, in Dominican Spanish. And I just know the nuances in, in, in Mexican Spanish just through like watching novelas, you know, just through that kind of exposure. And, you know, growing up, uh, my community had a lot of people from, I mean, my community was like a, almost like a melting pot. I had like friends from Mexico that were, you know, from Mexican descent, some that were uh, Vietnamese. So in that sense, you know, we're all trying to to communicate and we're just kind of like, you know, we need to get our point across. <laughs> no, I think that's great. And I can imagine the kind of like code switching that has to happen um, within the same language and, you know, similar to stories like the one that you just told. Um, I'm curious to know if in your experience, have you noticed any differences in the way that generations communicate? Um, Dominican families, maybe with, you know, the grandparents, the nieces, the cousins, and, you know, and even, well, now that, you know, we are, well, I'm not, but like having <laughs> children of, having children of our own, like, how have you noticed communication um in Dominican community within the Spanish language, like, ha have you noticed any shifts? Well, for my parents, it's very formal. We we use usted, you know, even if I say, which is like, in English, there isn't like a, it's just you formal, I guess. <laughs> um, in Spanish, there's the formal usted, which is like, you know, for older people, um, you know, parents, grandparents, and everybody else is informal, too. So, like, even to this day, I cannot address my mom with do. Like, she will not answer me. And then my dad, the same thing. Like, if he, they would say, like, oh, but we're not equal. That's what they say. Nosotros no somos iguales, you know? So, um, you cannot say, like, do to me. And then another thing that, like, with my son... I, I haven't even, actually, my son does say usted to my mom, and I never taught him that. Mm -hmm. So maybe he's just catching, like, grabbing onto what I'm saying, because he says usted to my mom. And I think he calls me, he he refers to me as tu. Oh, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> it's like opening a, a, like, Pandora's box right now. And then there's, like, a cultural... I don't know if other Spanish speaking um, countries do this, but in, in Dominican culture, like for older folks, you have to do something. Well, now you have to, I, I don't, well, let me not say I don't do it anymore. Um, there's this thing called la bendición, which is like the blessing. So before you go out anywhere, you tell your parent or your grandparent, la bendición, you know, mama, or, or another phrase is besame la mano, which is like literally uh, kiss my hand. So um, I used to do it as a kid, um, you know, but then for me, I don't know if it was just, you know, just the influence of just being in, you know, American influence. At a certain point, I was like, that's a lot of work because my mom, I had, she wanted me to do it for my mom, my dad, my sisters you know, aunts, uncles, and I'm like, you know, in my seven-year-old brain, I'm like, I don't have the time, you know, I, you know, I got things to do, to be doing like, oh, sion, sion. and then they, you know, in, in Dominican Spanish, we also cut off the, it's not, we, some people say bendición, but most of the time you hear like sion ma, sion whatever, sion pa, so like, I don't do it with my mom and she's like very annoyed by that because all my other sisters, my sisters do it. My brother doesn't do it. My mom is mad about that, but I do it with my dad. Like when I'm on the phone, I'm like, oh, siopa. And because if I don't say that, he just won't talk or he'll just keep talking about how I didn't say it and that he's waiting for me to say it. You know, and I was primarily raised here, but then my husband who was raised in DR for the most part, he doesn't, he doesn't have that tradition at all. So it's interesting how that like works out because they spent, I think he went, he alternated like kindergarten, he was here and then first grade he was in DR and then second, like he had way more time in DR than I did. 
And when I call, when I speak to relatives in DR, I have to say, like, you know, ask for this blessing. How does the bendición change from relative to relative? Um, it just goes, you just say like Sion, um, you know, Sion Tia, you know. It, you just you just add that Sion or Bendicion or La Bendicion. It just depends, I guess. Um, because I've heard it differently. Most of the time I hear I hear the Sion, you know, every time you go outside. So that was another thing too. Like you have to say it in the morning. And then every time you go outside, and then every time you get on the phone with somebody, I'm like, uh, like this is too much. So now, <laughs> so I just say it now, like to when I speak to some kind of, uh, you know, whatever relatives, like on WhatsApp and my dad, because he's just like very particular. This is interesting for me because I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this tradition. And I, it's so interesting. Like, I think, like, I get what you're saying to have to do it to many relatives can be time consuming, but I think... <laughs> for my seven-year-old brain. <laughs> <laughs> for your seven-year-old brain. But I think that it's it's really kind of cool to, like, recognize, you know, and and ask for a blessing from your family. And it's like, I just love family dynamics. I just, you know, I find it so interesting. And thank you. I learned something today. So you know with with dominican culture being so so much a part of new york i feel like dominican culture in new york is like you know it's one of like <laughs> like i i'm going to say like the five families of like new york city culture and i think it's just like so prevalent it's like so lively and and such a you know a part of New York City and I I don't want to make the assumption that things are the same here as they are in DR like I know they're not um and it's like you know like a it's its own culture I think um very much its own culture so how did you notice the Dominican uh language I guess particularly standing out among the other Spanishes spoken in New York City? Like, what is it about Dominican Spanish that makes it so unique, that makes it its own, um, and that makes it so noticeable? I think what makes it noticeable, I think is that we're, like, very creative with language. We're uh, There's always so many, like, phrases that I hear around, and I'm like wait what <laughs> and i i feel like now also with the the music movement now you know with the dembo like it's more like in your face it's everywhere you know you hear it and there's a lot of music uh, you know artists that have brought like dominican spanish to the scene you know you have romeo from aventura that everybody like loves you know, you have the bachata scene, you had like Prince Royce for a while that, you know, was very popular. You have, he's not Dominican, but Bad Bunny collaborates with a lot of Dominican artists and uses a lot of like, you know, shout, gives a lot of shout outs to Dominican artists that he works with and uses Dembo. So I feel like now we're at the forefront just because of like the music, because I remember when I was growing up, even to the point that I was like in college and working, a lot of people would like, like look, like frowned upon Dominican Spanish mm. um, because they would say like, oh, that it's not proper. It's not formal. It's, uh, I remember I had somebody tell me, oh, I didn't think you were Dominican because of the way you speak Spanish, because I can understand you. That's what they told me. R yeah. Yeah, like a direct quote. I mean, it wasn't that it's direct. It was in Spanish. And I was just like, what? <laughs> so like, for me, um, you know, it was like, now that I see, you know, there's more of an acceptance of just, you know, speaking the way you want to speak. And now like, it's kind of cool now, right? Like the like the way that we say certain things and the words and the the way that we come up with different words and different um just like the it's just like now it's more popular now everybody wants to uh 
you know, speak Dominican Spanish or Puerto Rican <laughs> Spanish because uh, it's cool now. But before, oh, my God, I remember there that I had a teacher that said that if we were to go to Spain speaking the way that we do, they would tell us to speak English. And I was just like, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So it was like rough, you know, because you felt like you couldn't even kind of. Like you felt like what you were speaking was wrong, but then it's like, what am I supposed to do? This is the way that I speak. <laughs> That's awful. That's awful. And I can't believe, like, sometimes I cringe at some things that teachers said to me, like in the nineties, I'm like, how did you get away with that? Like, right. <laughs> you know, and, and the thing is that, it, that was said because maybe somebody said that to them, right? Right. So it's like, you know, this cycle of feeling like your Spanish is not good enough. Like you you cannot use your Spanish to communicate because people say that they cannot speak to you because they don't understand you. Or if they do understand you, it's because you've reached, you know, this level of Spanish that, I don't know, that not everybody gets to I guess I don't know yeah. but yeah it was very 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 hurtful too because for a long time um going into a kind of another subject when I once I became a mom I was like can I even do this you know um because at that point when I became a mom I wasn't using Spanish like I used to um I, like I had mentioned I had worked um with uh the Mex Mexican population for a long time. So I was using my Spanish regularly. But then once I became a teacher, um, that I was working with students that were, um, you know, they had the label as ESL, EL, uh, English language learner. Um, the schools that I've worked in have all been dual language schools. So there was a strand of Spanish and English, and then there was a, the strand of only English. So the majority of the times the kids that only spoke Spanish or or were bilingual Spanish and English were in the dual language. So I worked with the students that spoke, you know, Albanian, Punjabi, Bangla. So I didn't have to use Spanish anymore. So by the time that, so that was almost like what? Almost eight years of only, of not using Spanish in like a professional setting, um, only at home when, at home, I would be speaking to my mom and I would be like, oh, I need to I need to look that up in, on Google. And then my as soon as my mom would say something, she's like, oh, here we go again. Like Annie's typing something that she wants to say <laughs> on Google. So because I wasn't using it, I wasn't reading, I wasn't um, interacting with Spanish at all. During my pregnancy, I'm like, oh, my God, how are we going to do this? And then my husband was in the same boat, too, because we just spoke Spanish with our parents, we didn't speak Spanish to each other mm. um, because it was just like very awkward. And then for me, I don't know about him, but for me, I would have that, you know, kind of like, you know, the little devil on the, the, the side saying, your Spanish is not good. Your Spanish is not good. Like, how are you going to, you know, pass it down if it's not good? <laughs> so I had to like do a lot of like, um, kind of like almost like soul searching. Like I started taking classes in Spanish. I, I started buying books, um, like picture books that would eventually go to my son, but I was reading them out loud and like writing down the words and putting, like I was literally being my own ESL teacher. Like I was putting, you know, writing down the words on post-its and putting it in the book. And yeah, it was, it was a process. <laughs> I think, well, first of all, I'm sorry that you had those thoughts about, you know, your Spanish not being good enough. And I think it's really sad that, you know, Span from what I've heard from Spanish speakers um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, is that always that comparison to Spain and that European Spanish standard. And it's like, well, you know, the language it started there but i mean you've got how many millions of people now hundreds of years later post colonialism and it becomes a language of its own so it's not wrong and i think that 
I can only imagine that, you know, being younger, we didn't have that vocabulary to say, you know, to, to have that thought process or to even think about it in that way. But like, I, one thing that I say on this show a lot, and I just hate is when people have been taught to feel like their language is not a language or it's not good enough. Because as you said, even with the music, you have people singing in this language, people using terms from this language. How can it not be real? You know, it it has value and it, it allows you to communicate. So um, I'm sorry that you had that experience, but I am glad that you found a way to reconnect with your language and to share it with your son. And I think that's so precious. Yeah. And you know, it took, it took me a while. Like I was telling my husband, I was like, cause I was looking, I was like, Oh my God, how are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to, you know, parent, you know, this way. And then my husband, he's like more of a realist. He's like, Annie, our parents did it. <laughs> we speak Spanish and English. <laughs> and I'm because there was a day that I was trying out the different like strategies and I'm very like, I'm like a rule follower. Like if you tell me this is how you're supposed to do it and we're not doing it that way, I'm like, you know, I throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm like, okay. so one time <laughs> we tried to do like, he speaks English and then I speak Spanish. This was all happening and, you know, he was not even bored yet. This was during my pregnancy because I said, this is like a language boot camp and we need to get, you know, like once he comes out, we need to know what to do. And he's like, okay, he, you know, he, you know, bless his heart. <laughs> he's very, he just goes along with me. <laughs> um, so one day we were trying, you know, he does English and I do Spanish. Like, you know, he's speaking in English to me and I respond to Spanish in Spanish to him, or we did it the other way around. I know that I just got really mad because one of us broke the rules. And then I'm like, oh, my God, we won't be able to do this. We're just failing. We're just failing. We're not going to be able to do, you know, teach him Spanish. And then he's like, that's when he told me, he's like, Annie, do you realize that we're both bilingual? <laughs> he's like, how the, he's, you know, how did our parents do it? And I'm like, well, we just spoke Spanish at home. He's like, there we go. We just got to speak Spanish at home. Oh, man, that's crazy enough to work, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but. And as he, you know, when he was little, it was just us kind of like just speaking to him. And it was more so for us to have the foundation and feel comfortable because when he and I started, to, you know, my husband and I started speaking Spanish to each other, I was like, oh, like, do I really have to? It, 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 it almost felt like it, it, like, you know, like it didn't feel natural. It was kind of mm -hmm. like what we were talking about, you know, with friends you know, we, our real whole relationship was in English. So now to like switch it, it felt like I was, you know, with somebody else. I'm like, who is this guy? And why is he in my house? <laughs> I was even taking classes. That was another hard part because a lot of the classes that are provided for Spanish, it's not for what they call heritage speakers. Mm. So that was another struggle that I had that the classes that I would find were too, um, like, for lack of a better word, too basic. So it was a lot of conversation. And I didn't need like, I needed like conversation, but I didn't need that to be like, everything. So then I was looking and, and trying to find somewhere that I could fit because it, it was also awkward to speak Spanish, know how to read in Spanish, know how to write in Spanish, and then still feel like you don't even belong in a class that's teaching Spanish. Mm. Um, so then I had found, um, I think somebody had posted it up on Instagram, this group called Spanish Sin Pena, which is called Spanish Without Shame, because um, the woman who founded it, um, I think there, it's Wendy and Jackie, they, I guess, you know, saw that a lot of heritage speakers, people that are Latinx, um, don't feel represented or, or, or feel like they want to connect to their culture, to their language, and they can't. And, but it's also shameful to be like, 
I, I don't know what to do now. Like, I don't know how to pass this on. I don't know how to improve. So after I went to that class, it was like, wow, like, you know, this is amazing. These are my people. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I did like a whole, I did a semester with them. I actually just did another semester with them. So I, I was with the same girl who did the conversation class, um, Anna. And then when she saw me this semester, she's like, wow, you're, you've improved a lot in your, you know, just your comfort level. And it was through that class because it was, it was really hard and it's all online too. Uh, it was just really hard to, to want to improve. And then still like, you feel like you're an other in your community because you're not speaking Spanish or you, you don't sound like you speak Spanish. Um, and then you feel like an other in places that people are trying to learn Spanish too. Wow. Yeah, I understand that. And I want to like, this is like a sidebar, but I've definitely want to have more of these kind of conversations when it comes to like identity, um, culture and language, because there's like, you know, we could sit here and, and dissect the language all we want, but there are real people behind it and real experiences. And I never even considered how like you would go into a Spanish class and you would just feel like it's not for you, like whether you can identify it or not. But as you're as you're talking about it, like I I can see how that would be like really frustrating you know developing those I mean I'm not a teacher but developing a curriculum for people to learn Spanish I imagine is really general and broad so and and your situation was very specific um so I'm glad that they um developed a course that you know you can work you can work on the language without shame and I think that's really important we don't want anyone to feel any shame when it comes to language so yeah yeah I'm glad you had a positive experience with that for sure one thing that I love about the way that Dominicans speak Spanish is how quick and rhythmic it is and I noticed that also in uh the music also can be very quick and obviously rhythmic because it's music duh um but I think also <laughs> Uh, what's interesting to me is, you know, in New York City, our pace of life is very quick and we move very quickly. We speak very quickly. You know, everything is is quick, fast and in a hurry. Um, do you feel in any way like the the rhythm of Dominican Spanish mimics, echoes, follows the cadence of New York life in New York City at all or are there any influences that you feel maybe that Dominicans here have that maybe Dominicans in other parts of the country don't have, or even in DR, like, does the language change at all um, geographically in that way? I kind of feel like, well, here is definitely, it goes along, like, just like you said, with the cadence, the, the fast pace, the, the, you know, moving, 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 uh, kind of electricity of, of New York, it's definitely, you know, palpable in, in Dominican Spanish. Um, I'm thinking about, like, my relatives that are in DR, like, I've, I'm not even sure. I feel like there's definitely more presence, English presence in Dominican Spanish if you're based out of, like, New York. Um, but with my relatives, I feel like I haven't even, like, I feel like it might be a little slower and also, but I feel like the, 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 the pace in DR, like Dominican Republic is much more relaxed than New York city. Um, and I feel like my cousins do speak a little slower, but I'm not, now I'm thinking like, if it's, if it switches based on who you're speaking to mm. because I feel like when I hear them speaking to like to my aunts and their parents it's a little slower and then when they're speaking to like their friends 
like sometimes even when I go to DR, I have to be like, wait, what? Like, but I don't know if it's just like, you know, kind of like the frequency is like changing. <laughs> but Dominican Spanish here in New York, um, like you can, you can always point out like somebody who's Dominican just by the way that that's why, like for me, I notice that the way that I speak is slower because that's where a lot of people say, like I speak to them in Spanish and they're like, you grew up here, right? Mm. And I'm like, how do you know? You know? And I don't know if it's just the, the, because I take a longer time to like process it. Like I'm like, oh, did I say that right? Or, um, so some people can tell if they're from like DR they're like, oh, you, you're, you're Dominican York. They, they say you're Dominican York. <laughs> I want to change gears a little bit um, and talk about literature and talk about books. I know that you are an avid reader and you're a book lover like me. Um, and you share on your platform many Spanish uh, books and resources for um you know, for Spanish speakers and for parents who are, you know, raising bilingual children or, um, and I would love to know, um, you know, what are some Dominican authors that you love, uh, some Dominican books that you love or stories that you love, um, and things that you've shared? Um, the last, last year I read, um, these two books, by these uh two Dominican authors that I really 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 love like one was I it was my, the first audiobook that I ever finished um it was um how not to drown in a glass of water by Angie Cruz um so that's like a Dominican phrase it it translates to um well the the phrase is how not to drown and it's like Sometimes your mom or parent or whoever might tell you, like, you might be going through something, but you're don't drown in like a glass of water, like, you know, relax. So by Angie Cruz, and she has many books. Uh, she has one called Dominicana. Um, she has this one. And I think she has another one called Soledad that I think I read. And I really, I really love um, her style of writing. It's very like, it's very Dominican. You know, even when I was listening, she even had like, because um, the book is based on a middle aged Dominican woman. And I was just listening to her. And then my husband's like, is that your mom? <laughs> like, it literally sounds like I'm listening to my mom's WhatsApp voice messages. That's how like, amazing that narration is on that audiobook. And it was just an amazing book. It was based on, um, like I said, a middle-aged woman living in uh, Washington Heights. Um, so that was a great book. And another one that I read by a Dominican author, um, her name is uh, Clavis Nat Natera. Um, her book was called Neruda on the Park, um, which was also amazing book and I was able to like speak to her because she came on like a book club chat and it was amazing to just you know be able to to speak to her and and see where she was going so in that book it speaks more like about like gentrification in a Washington Heights neighborhood um and another one uh that everybody she's pretty more she's like very well known um Elizabeth Acevedo that has you know the poet x which I also loved um I think the other one is called Fire on, on High. Mm -hmm. And now she's coming out with a new one in August that I'm super excited about because it's it's geared for adults. The other ones are like more like, you know, young adult. Then I read uh, a compilation of stories from a lot of like well-known and not so well-known Dominican writers from the, uh, this, I guess they would be like a business called Dominican Writers. So she compiled all of these like um essays from different dominican authors just talking about like what it is to be from you know dominican york and being <laughs> dominican from dr and how you feel like you're not from here and you're not from there um so that was a, a, a very beautiful um 
like anthology. Yeah. <laughs> All of those books are on my to read list. Oh, sure. awesome. <laughs> Seriously. And I, you know, because I am a big fan of reading Caribbean literature. And I think the reason why well, I know the reason why is because it's so easy to look at well, not me, because I am of Caribbean heritage myself, but I think it's so easy for people to look at the Caribbean as just a playground and a place for enjoyment and not really even consider like people live here and they don't just live here to serve you. Um, and they have lives and stories. And I love reading stories from the Caribbean. Like I've intentionally, um, you know, I've made the choice to read Caribbean, <laughs> to read mostly Caribbean books. So um, those books are definitely on my list as well. And they are, I actually follow Dominican writers too, um, because like, I, I think that's such a great way to, to learn about your own culture, to learn about other cultures is, is through reading. So I'm glad to be talking to a fellow reader right now. <laughs> yeah. And you know, for, like growing up, I would find, I would never find these books. Of you course. know, I, I mostly would fi find that kind of community when I would read books about other cultures. So I would read like, you know, House on Mango Street. And I'm like, oh, this kind of reminds me of, you know, my community. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I would read, you know, something about like, let's say like, a, like the Joy Luck Club. I'm like, oh, this kind of reminds me of the dynamic that I have with my mom. But I never found until recently, you know, books that were like about the Dominican experience. And then and definitely not any picture books, which is how like I started even my account, because I never had any experience with picture books that were, you know, that mentioned a, a platano. Like, <laughs> what? like I, I would share these books with my mom and she would be learning certain things. And she's like, wow, like, I didn't know they had that in, you know, DR or like, I didn't, because she, she, it was actually interesting when I showed her that she's like, that she never thought about that somebody else would think this is important. And I'm like, ma, it is, you know? So she like appreciates that, you know, my son is very like, he has this pride that I don't think I had growing up. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. It's so important. It's so, so important. What are some things, cultural expressions, Dominican things, like in like like very Dominican things that you notice in New York that you love? Um, things, what are things that make you feel maybe even nostalgic for a time spent in Dominican Republic? Um, what are some things that you love about the Dominican community here and things that you that you enjoy ex experiencing it was funny I was talking to my mom about it I'm like oh man like do you ever think about you know going back to DR and she's like what's she's like or what DR is here mm. or she's like you know you feel at home like my mom has been able to like be herself here and she you know she she doesn't speak that much English she's been able everything everything that she's done in terms of like work my mom uh, it was like a home health aide. All her, you know, the elderly patients she worked with were all Dominican, you know. So I love that we have created a space where, you know, you can go down like to like Washington Heights or even Inwood and you can go get like, you know, what like you can get a bar of soap or something that you would only find in DR. You can find it at the store. Or, yeah, uh, or just like, you know, any kind of treat that you would want. So like for us, we would have um, this thing called habichuelas con dulce, which is like sweet beans that would only, we would only have that like during um, like Easter time. And for me, that was something only that my mom did. But you go down to like 181st and you'll find somebody who's selling that all year round. <laughs> So it just feels, um, it feels like you're, like you're part of a community um, and you feel like you're home. Like I've never had, I've never lived in DR for any, any at all. I mean, I came, I was here, I was living here already. I was like one years old. So 
for me, all of these things I experienced just through my family. So to see it outside of my family and see it just everywhere you go, like, you know, you go down 181st, you see even the streets, the school, there's like a, a Hermanas Mirabal school, like, and you're like, oh, wow. Like, you know, you feel like important. You feel like, wow, this is, this is home. And when I had that time that I wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I live in the Bronx, even in the Bronx, I still feel like I see, you know, Spanish everywhere. I, I can go to a school and I know that my son won't be like the other. He, he's, he like is part of a community. He can see himself in his teachers. Even for me, like a lot of people would say like, oh, that they never had a Latinx or a teacher in their life. And all of my teachers, for the most part, have either been Dominican or, you know, from some, from Latin America, some like, you know, and I feel like that's like a very beautiful thing, you know, because you can't find that anywhere. You can't, and then to to see what you're what you're looking at in books and then seeing it in real life. So like when I read that last book, um, what is it called? Oh, uh, Platanos van con todo. Pl Platanos go with everything. And I saw like the illustrations and even like the house, the apartments. And I was like, this looks like my mom's apartment. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, you know, my son is like pointing out, oh, this is the Dominican flag. And, you know, so it's like really and to see that, you know, that place in a book is where you live. It's like, whoa, you know, somebody thinks somebody finds what I do, who I am important and wants to share it. And I feel like, you know, you feel pride for, for wanting to share it. And then also like co coexisting with other people too, because even within like the Dominican neighborhoods or even where we live, um, there's there's um, people from different backgrounds and we're all like coexisting. Mm. So it's, like a, it's a really nice thing. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And I love, you know, the times I've been up in Washington Heights and Inwood. And I'm like, like I said, I haven't been to DR, but, you know, I would imagine that that's as close as I've been <laughs> <laughs> until I actually get there, which is great. You know, I think that's what makes our city so dynamic is like having areas where people can be themselves and they can experience, you know, their home, their culture in just a short train ride. I think it's amazing. I have so enjoyed this conversation, Annie, and talking hey. with you has just been so much fun. Um, please tell us about your platform on Instagram, online, and let us know a little bit about what you do. And most importantly, let us know where we can find you. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm working on other things like trying to open up, get a website. But right now I'm on Instagram and I'm under la, I think it's underscore Lorenzona. <laughs> um, La Lorenzona is just um my son's name. That's what we call his room. So his name is Lorenzo. So we call his play space La Lorenzona because that's where we spend most of our time. So when I started that Instagram page, um, that's kind of the name that stuck out to me because it was about things that we do together. Um, that I thought would be helpful for parents, just as my background as, you know, a teacher for many years, working with uh, multilingual, bilingual students, working at the library for a long time. So all that breadth of knowledge was now like I used for my son. And then I kind of just wanted to share it with everybody else. So on my page, you'll just find literally what you would find, like the random things you would find in your kid's room. It's it's like, <laughs> it's La Lorenzona. You find, you know, I, I've i been focusing a lot about uh, books now because I haven't been in the classroom, but since my son was born. So I still put up like 
teaching things and things about education and language. Um, I put up a lot of book reviews for, because that was a really tough venture, finding books that weren't about like, you know, a panda bear or something like <laughs> books about like kids that look like my son and other kids, you know, in our community and that were in Spanish. That was like the big, you know, point. Like I yeah. couldn't find those books. Yeah, that's my platform. I'm trying to work on other projects to kind of expand on that. Um, just to give more access because I feel like, you know, I'm reviewing these books and then it's like I have the books in my house. So I, I my new project is to create a, what I call Lorenzo's Little Library where I'll be sharing his books with like people that said that they were interested in it. So I had put like a survey as to who would be interested in being like part of this little community uh, like for a little membership fee, like for shipping costs and whatever, and to share some of the books that I have with like people that have been engaging with me for like, I guess a year now, because I've had that, I've had that page for a year now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a mom myself, but I love your content and I think it's so accessible and so very necessary, um, you know, for for children, for children of color, for Latin children, um, Latinx children to see themselves reflected. And I'm glad this is part of the conversation that um, our kids get to have that we didn't get to have. I think that um, I think it's so special and I really applaud you for doing your part in this conversation and and helping to amplify voices of people who are building community and and adding resources to the community um, for everyone. So uh, I will add your information to the show notes of this episode so that anyone listening and wants to get in touch, wants to follow you can just click and do so right away. Awesome. <laughs> um, like I said, this has been fun. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it's really been so much fun talking with you and learning more about you and what you do and your family and your language and your culture, of course. Um, thank you so much for joining me on this episode. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I like to end each episode on the same question, just to have a little bit of fun. Do you have any jokes, popular sayings, tongue twisters, cool slang words, idioms, words of wisdom, or words of advice in Dominican Spanish to share and to teach us? Uh, yeah, I actually have one that I had shared oh, a couple of weeks ago, like this Dominican phrase called alofoque, <laughs> alofoque. <laughs> That you do things, that's how I kind of try to do things now, like alo foque, like alo whatever. You just mm -hmm. do it. Uh, you know, it's like a play on, you know, I don't like cursing, but it's kind of like a la F-U-C-K it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's kind of like, you know, like kind of the equivalent to YOLO. Like you're just doing it. You're not thinking about it. You're just, you know... Just doing it. And, the, <laughs> <laughs> and I love that because I would always hear that phrase or my dad would say a lot like, go hello con take it easy, like take it easy. But, you know, in Dominican way. <laughs> and, you know, as a kid, you hear these things and you're like, oh, it's so funny or whatever. But then like when you're an adult, you're like, oh, yeah, I do have to live like this. <laughs> And just, you know, let the cards, you know, fall where they may. And you just, you know, you just never know, like, um, you know, what it might lead to. So just living life like that. And, and even like the the title of the book that I had mentioned, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water. Uh, in Spanish is, uh, Que no te ahogues en un, en un vaso de agua. So just not letting things stress you out when you when it's just really like a glass of water you're not in the ocean not even in a bathtub <laughs> a glass of water <laughs> um okay so we've got alofoque 
and <laughs> I always have to try. No, I got to try that's every right. language and repeat after everyone because that's part of learning. And that's part of like not being afraid to, you know, to try and maybe you, you mess it up and you a lo foque, right? Right. So. <laughs> I mean, that's what happens with me too, because, you know, I, um, I understand like where you're coming from because I was so far removed from Spanish. So I had to relearn it and I had to relearn it just by, you know, making mistakes and just <laughs> hearing people say like, oh, you don't really speak Spanish. You don't, you, you learn Spanish in a second language, right? And I'm like, mm. no, it's actually my first. Oh no, I don't believe you. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Exactly. But now, you know, I've gotten to the point that, you know, I'm confident. Another thing that, you know, was hard for me was even, you know, writing in Spanish. So then when I, because, but then like for me, I was like, oh, I'm reviewing these books that are in Spanish, but I'm writing it, the caption in English. But it was because writing in Spanish was such like a pain point for me that I'm like, oh God, like, you know, me writing in Spanish was like going to take me twice the time. Mm. Not even twice the time. Maybe like 10 times. Can you just really quickly take me through the second thing that you shared, the second phrase that you shared, so I can repeat after you? So it's, uh, no te ahogues. No te ahogues? Mm -hmm. En un vaso de agua. En un vaso de agua? Yeah. Yeah, you read that book and you'll, it's in English, just so you know. It hasn't come out in Spanish yet. Okay. Um, But it's in English yeah it's on my list well annie thank you again no, for stopping you. by for conversation <laughs> um really quickly in the dominican community here in new york if we were two people talking such as we were today and enjoyed the conversation and we're about to go our separate ways what is the best way to say goodbye I would just say, oh, I usually, I mean, I don't think it's a Dominican way. I would just say like, oh, hasta la próxima. See you next time. And then my mom would add, si Dios quiere, if God allows it. So that's usually what you would hear at the end, oh, si Dios quiere. Or, ah, okay. Yeah. But hasta... I usually I usually say just hasta la próxima or nos vemos or, yeah. Okay. Hasta la próxima. Nos vemos. Annie? Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be talking to you soon. Bye. Bye. New episodes of Speaking Tongues are available every Monday, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to like and share episodes with other language lovers like ourselves. Abiento.